My name is Peter Stevens. I'm a professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah. I will be presenting guided growth for limb length inequality. The objectives are to dis discuss the role of reversible guided growth for limb length inequality and provide illustrative cases. Dr. Femister in 1923 introduced the concept of the bone block shown here to produce epiphysiodesis for limb length or angular correction. The drawbacks are that this requires precise timing and therefore has a narrow age range, usually during adolescence. Dr. Blount introduced the vitalium staples with reinforced shoulders, but the staples could migrate, as you just saw. Nevertheless, this was the only option and was in widespread use for several decades. The problem is that the rigid staple opposed to the dynamic physis will typically fail by bending, breaking, or migration, as shown here. And this is possible with any rigid implant placed around or across the physis. The Blount staple shown here migrated after six months of uh, placement, requiring repeat surgery. With respect to current treatment of limb length inequality, the clinical exam is of course important, leveling the pelvis with blocks and obtaining a comparable full length AP view of the legs with the patellas centered. Other views are optional, such as lateral views. It also is helpful to determine bone maturity by some method. A common method is with the hand film. There are more sophisticated methods, all of which have some drawback in terms of accuracy. Bone age determination is often plus or minus one year of accuracy. And uh, I mentioned that the standing AP x-ray of the legs is most useful rather than a scanogram. The scanogram does not include the pelvis or the foot, and it does not, it's not weight-bearing and does not show the mechanical axis. A previously popular method that is still useful when you use reversible technology is the Warren White method, popularized by Menelaus. This is based on the estimation that in the average adolescent population, the distal femur will grow 0.9 centimeters per year and the proximal tibia 0.6 centimeters for a total of 1.5 centimeters per year. Females mature sooner, about age 14, and males at age 16. We know that with changes in, uh, in the population and nutrition and uh, intercultural exchange that these are just very rough guidelines. Nevertheless, they are useful when you're using reversible technology. There's a subtle difference when using tension bands for length. In fact, Rather than being tension bands, as shown on the right, they're more comparable to a staple. They provide passive correction with some lag or delayed effect of three to six months, as is seen in other techniques. But importantly, if you use this in younger children, you should remove the metaphyseal screws or the implants after two years, allow continued growth, and then reapply. Shown on the left is angular correction, where there is no time limit, and the screws are placed parallel. And for length, on the right, I place the screws somewhat divergent because if you place them parallel, they may bend or diverge over time, implying that lag effect. So shown on the right is the initial placement of divergent screws to mitigate that problem. Case examples for anisomelia. A typical case I'll show is an adolescent where this may be the definitive procedure versus temporizing in children under 10 where it has to be reversible. This child had developmental dislocation of the left hip, treated by medial open reduction and spica cast. You can see the slight effects of osseous necrosis. The femoral head has recovered, but the femoral neck is shorter. The femoral head is slightly larger on the left. The trochanteric height is elevated. Up until age 10, she was asymptomatic. During adolescence, she developed a 3 centimeter discrepancy. On the left, you see the full-length film with a 3 centimeter block. You can see that her physes are open, and by calculation, it appeared that pipsiodesis on the right would be uh, sufficient given her skeletal maturity. And by age 15, she had achieved equal limb lengths as shown here, and the implants can optionally be removed if symptomatic. On the other hand, this infant with hemangioma and gigantism is headed for many surgical procedures, possibly major, and uh, many problems. By age almost five, she presented with left hip pain and a four centimeter discrepancy. 
She has long leg dysplasia on the left. The projected discrepancy at maturity was closer to 7 centimeters. The options shown here would be to lengthen a normal leg, which is not logical or safe, or to shorten the involved leg, which is also major surgery. Here is her hemangioma with principal involvement below the knee at this point and principal discrepancy below the knee. She underwent temporizing restraint of the left proximal tibia first. Two years later, the strategy was to remove the metaphyseal screws and add screws to add implants to the femur to reduce her overall discrepancy and make this more manageable. You can see the metaphyseal screw removal done percutaneously through very small incisions, as shown here. She uh, continued with follow-up and growth. The metaphyseal screws were reinserted in 2010. I should mention she has never worn a shoe lift. Her hip symptoms were resolving, and she had a fully active lifestyle. But it's important to follow any technique periodically, at least twice a year, with a full-length view. You can see in the center she has a drift toward varus, and uh, this was handled by inserting the lateral screw in the proximal tibia to pull this out of varus, and simultaneously she had drilling of the proximal fibular physis. This ha does not have to be done routinely, but it was felt it would help to correct the varus deformity. By 11, She's undergone the procedures listed here, all of which were outpatient procedures without a cast, without physical therapy, uh, without um, major hardware. Here she is in 2013 with uh, nearly equal limb lengths. The metaphyseal screws were removed, as shown here, done percutaneously, leaving the epiphyseal screws and the plates in the event that these would be needed in the future. And uh, it's important, as I mentioned, to use low-profile, flexible implants. Um, she will be seen until maturity and may not need further surgery. In conclusion, guided growth has a wide range of applications with diverse modular solution for limb length inequality and preferable to osteotomy. Complications are rare and readily managed. The biologic effects of flexible tethering deserve further study. Thank you.